I've got over 110 hours into Manor Lords at this point, and over 10,000 words of notes in my Notion page. I've distilled those notes down into the biggest 10 mistakes that I made while learning Manor Lords, so hopefully you can learn from them. Let's jump right into it. The storehouse and granary can function as more than just a storage area for hoarding goods. They can help increase production in your other buildings by keeping their inventory cleared out. If a production building runs out of inventory space, the workers have to stop and haul a single item at a time to storage, then resume work again. A storage worker can use a handcart to carry 10 items at a time, making them 10 times more efficient than production building workers at moving goods. On top of that, storage buildings should be placed strategically around your town to minimize how far workers need to travel to get their input resources. For example, this warehouse is built on the outskirts of town where clay, tiles, planks, and iron are created and stored. All of these inputs and outputs are collected here, while the main storage building at the center of town has these items disabled to minimize their travel time. If you don't disable it, storage workers from the center of town will eventually get some of those resources, and then the production workers from this side of the town will have to travel all the way to the center and back just to get those resources. It's better to disable the inventory where you don't want it, and keep it only where you do want it. Doing this should avoid most production bottlenecks caused by logistics. And as we'll see in the next section, granaries should be placed as close to the market stalls as possible, since stall workers will restock inventory from the granary. The market stall's function is to satisfy the three main categories for each family, food, clothing, and firewood. Each market stall has a maximum inventory limit equal to the number of burgage plots that you currently have. So if you have 10 burgage plots, then each stall is allowed to have a maximum of 10 of each item. 10 berries, 10 veggies, 10 meat, 10 leather, 10 linen, 10 shoes, etc. These items are then sent directly to the houses automatically. Peasants don't need to visit stalls to buy things, and stall workers don't sell house to house. The goods just magically appear in each house at regular intervals throughout the month. The order of which house gets their goods first is based on how close they are to the market stall. So if you have only 5 leather out of the 10 maximum, then only the 5 closest houses to the stalls will get their leather and the other 5 will be empty. There's a lot to unpack here, so let's go over the most important takeaways. You should upgrade the houses that are closest to the markets to ensure their needs are met first, before the needs of the lower tier houses. You don't have to put marketplaces near houses. Instead, place them as close to your granary and whichever storehouse is holding firewood and clothing. The closer the storehouses are to your market, the better chance of keeping 100% stock they'll have, which keeps people happier. Don't make too many stalls at the start, as stall workers are basically lost efficiency if they're in a production building. Three stalls will be plenty for the first 15 houses. As you expand, clothing stalls and food stalls will be the main bottleneck because they have many types of goods that can be in stock, but only 50 storage space in each stall. If you have 25 houses, but 3 types of food, then a single food stall can only have 25 berries and 25 meat, but there's no room for the bread, which means those houses that need 3 food types are going to be pissed off. A good rule of thumb is to have 3 stalls for the first 15 houses and add 3 stalls for each 25 houses after that. It doesn't have to be calculated exactly, but just estimate. 75 houses should have around 9 to 12 stalls. One final caveat to this, if you're playing on easier difficulty settings, you can pretty much ignore most of your population's needs unless you want to upgrade their plot level, since it won't lower their approval that much. On the hardest difficulty setting though, having enough market stalls is crucial or your people will leave en masse and you'll end up with a ghost town. I know this from personal experience. It can be very difficult to see three months down the road when you're first starting out because you don't really know what to expect or what problems might pop up. This can get new players into deep trouble when it comes to expanding population. You might have enough food and wood for six months now, but if your population doubles in the next three months, then you'll have less than three months. This can quickly cascade and cause a shortage of food, firewood, clothing, or ale. Always keep a healthy reserve in stock and try not to go below this amount. I personally feel comfortable with at least 12 months of reserves or higher, especially when managing more than one town because if you focus on only one town for several months, the other towns will at least survive for a year before having terminal issues, which gives you time to react and fix those supply shortages. Having that peace of mind in Manor Lords is priceless. Oxen are needed to move timber around the map, which are used to build buildings, restock the logging camp, and supply the saw pit to make planks. 
If you've got five burgage plots ready to be built, a saw pit running, and a logging camp with workers in it, your single ox will have way more work than it can handle by itself, which will create a massive bottleneck for you. If it builds the buildings, then the planks aren't being created and new logs aren't being hauled into the logging camp. If logs are being hauled, then houses aren't being built, and so on and so forth. Instead, build more hitching posts and order more oxen. The ox only costs 20 gold each, and the hitching post costs a single log, so be sure to make more early on in your game. There's a 30-day cooldown for each ox that you order, so do it early and often. Also, if you decide to use the perk that allows an ox to help with your farming, you'll need to install another hitching post and ox for each farmhouse that you have. When setting out plots for farming, you have to keep a few things in mind. You'll need enough workers to plow and sow the field before the two preparation months are up, and again the following year you'll need enough people to harvest and store everything in one month. If you're off here, you'll end up wasting a ton of resources and labor. For example, if you make fields that should yield 100 pieces of barley, but your workers don't even finish plowing the whole field, you'll end up missing the planting season entirely without yielding a single barley. If you're using crop rotation, which I highly recommend you do, you have a single month to harvest everything before the field is switched to the next type in the cycle. Once the switch happens, everything on the field is instantly destroyed and you get nothing from it. This issue can be solved by doing a couple things. Build more farmhouses and staff them fully, which in my opinion is a poorly optimized band-aid fix. Or my personal favorite, take the large plot you made and cut it up into smaller pieces, but still maintain the exact same overall size. This makes it so your farmers will start and complete small pieces of the huge plot first before moving on to the next pieces. If you can't harvest the whole thing in time, you'll at least get some yield out of it. And more importantly, if you're using an ox to plow, it's significantly more efficient. As soon as the ox touches the field, everyone else is banned from helping. If you're using a single large field, then that ox might not even have time to finish it before the season is over, and you'll have wasted the entire year. If you have eight several smaller plots instead, the ox can plow one small chunk while the rest of the workers handle different smaller chunks at the same time. And if you're looking to optimize even more, build several farmhouses each with their own ox, but don't staff each farmhouse fully. Four farmhouses with two workers each and four oxen are much better than one farmhouse with one ox and the same eight workers, especially when you split up your large field into several smaller chunks to work. When you first rally troops, they default to sprinting, which can quickly deplete their stamina. A unit with no stamina is essentially useless because their effectiveness number is a damage and defense multiplier, meaning their attack and defense is nearly zero. Make sure to only sprint when absolutely necessary and give units a break between combat. This is especially important for the first few battles against bandits when you don't have a full unit of militia and they aren't well armored. Be sure to rest the militia between bandit camp fights so they can fight effectively and you shouldn't lose any men. One final tip, when using your starting spearmen, make sure they are not moving and let the brigands charge into you. Spearmen have the impale stat, which means they counter enemy charges and reflect their charge damage back to them. Your spearmen have to be facing the enemy and they cannot be moving in order to get this bonus. In the beginning, it's easy to have wood production buildings function efficiently because there are plenty of woods around to clear out. As time goes by, those tree lines are cut back further and further, meaning wood collection efficiency goes down over time. There are two solutions here. The first is best to do in the early stages when you don't have a lot of spare workers and involves moving the buildings back to a new tree line. Wood production buildings can be moved for free with the four arrow button at the top. Two things to remember here. Don't forget to connect the new building location with a road and don't move buildings that have a lot of inventory in them still, especially if it's raining or snowing as those resources will quickly be destroyed. Timber logs don't count in this, by the way. To avoid this, put another warehouse worker so they can pull these resources first, and then move the building. The other option is much better for the mid to late game when you have workers to spare and involves using a forester's hut. You can build and staff a forester hut, set the work area to nearby your wood production area, and the trees will quickly be grown over time, allowing for infinite wood production without having to move buildings or micromanage anything. Be aware though, trees cannot be planted during the winter, so pull these workers during the season if you wish. And one quick bonus tip, don't move logging camps. Instead, just build new ones. 
Logs aren't stored anywhere else due to their size, and inventory is linked between all the logging camps. So if one camp fills up, workers will fill up the empty logging camps, and you'll have backup storage. In the early game, it can be quite challenging to get your village to grow quickly. Once your approval rating is at 50% or higher, you'll start to get people moving in, but only if you have spare housing. And since the game moves people in slowly, only one family per month between 50 and 74 approval, and two families per month at 75 and above, it's incredibly important to always have empty houses ready to go based on your approval. If you're only getting one family per month, having two to three empty houses should be enough to have you stay ahead of the curve, constantly building more as people move in. If approval is 75 or higher, then a larger cushion should be used. I generally like to build houses in groups of five or more. If you make smaller groups, you can end up with larger plots with fewer houses on them. But at five or more, the game crams as many houses in as possible in that tight space. One final thought on this. If your goal is to reach a higher population, let's use 500 as an example, then it can take 162 months to reach that level with one family per month moving in, or 81 months at the higher move-in rate. If you're only building houses when you hit the limit, this number will effectively double because you'll miss that immigration tick for the month while your people build more houses. 162 months is almost 14 years, and with poor housing expansion, that doubles to nearly 28 years. On the fastest speed setting, each year takes 20 minutes to elapse. So even if you were to play the game at 12x speed without pausing, it would take over 9 hours to get there instead of 4 while using good house platting. Each region has two rich resources of some kind that will either have a huge amount or with a perk, an infinite amount. That means the other resources will not be found in abundance there, making it challenging to produce everything you need using only the land. For example, if you've got rich berries and iron, you'll have plenty of early game food and can produce weapons, tools, and armor infinitely. But eventually you'll run out of the other stuff like clay, and producing ale will be challenging and inefficient in these lands. Instead of running farms on low fertility, you can import the needed resources. You can directly import the goods you need for a higher price, or you can import the base materials needed to produce these goods. Which route you should go depends entirely on what you have in excess. Do you have a lot of laborers sitting around doing nothing? Then you should import the cheapest base materials and put these people to work converting those goods for you. If you buy ore for 3 gold, or 13 if you don't have the perk, and turn that ore into a helmet, then you'll end up saving 3 gold per helmet using idle laborers that weren't doing anything anyways. On the other hand, if you have plenty of regional wealth, but no spare labor, then it can oftentimes be cheaper just to buy it. The math can be a little bit complicated here, but I'll simplify. If you're making 2000 gold per month on the whole village, and you have 50 families there, then each family is worth 40 gold per month in production. Using the previous scenario, we saved 3 gold per helmet by making it in-house, and it would take at least 2 families to produce each helmet. One to smelt the ore, and the armor to actually make the helmet. Which means 2 families worth of production is 80 gold per month, and we would have to produce at least 27 helmets to even break even. Even more important, you'll be diverting your precious mental capacity to micromanage this small operation. It's much better to import the goods and be done with it when possible. There are going to be a lot of people telling you what you should and shouldn't be doing in Manor Lords, myself included. But the best piece of advice I can give is to figure out how you enjoy the game and stay true to that. Maybe it's more efficient to build your town a certain way, but it would look ugly and you much prefer to manage an historically accurate and visually appealing town. Forget about efficiency and make it the way you want. Me, personally, I couldn't care less about how my town looks, but it bothers me to no end having an inefficient town. So when I get comments about how ugly my grid system looks, I simply agree, it is ugly. But then I continue forward with my ugly but highly efficient towns because that's how I enjoy the game. If you have no interest in combat, don't let peer pressure convince you to turn bandits and raiding on, only to stress out when you get those pop-ups about stolen goods and being attacked. The only person you should care about is you. Go find what makes you happy and stick with it. And that's my list of the 10 biggest mistakes that I made while learning Manor Lords, and I hope my loss is your gain. I've got several more Manor Lords guides coming up, including a beginner's guide and a complete guide covering every single thing in the game. Literally everything. A huge shout out to the Patreon supporters and YouTube members who help financially support my small channels. I really appreciate everything you've done for me. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.